are in listen only mode. Welcome to AMSA's webinar titled Maximize Your Impact, Building Collaboration Through Social Media. My name is Sabrina Ziegler and I'm AMSA Sectoral Communications Coordinator and I will be guiding us through today's webinar. I'm accompanied today by various colleagues here in the AMSA office. My colleague who's with me and who will be assisting me in the chat box today is Melissa J, AMSA's Communications and Office Coordinator. We are joined today by immigrant settlement agencies from across BC and the Western region who have joined us for this online learning experience. Our presenter today is Jennifer Baker. We are excited about the knowledge and insight that she will be sharing during today's webinar. Before we dive into the content though, let's go through a couple areas of housekeeping. So on the right hand side of your screen, you will see what they call the GoToWebinar control panel. This panel is um, expandable or you can hide it using the little orange arrow which is on the right, on the left hand side on the top of that control panel. Also there, there's various different tabs that you will see on your control panel such as audio or chat and there's a little plus sign next to those panels. It's you're able to expand those panels by clicking on that plus sign. And if you're listening to this webinar right now, you will be listening through the option that's indicated in the audio um, called mic and speakers. If you do have any technical difficulties listening to the audio of the webinar via the computer through your mic and speakers, you have the option of changing that and clicking the telephone function and that will reveal a Canadian 647 phone number that you can call with an access code. There are long distance charges for listening via the telephone and those charges will depend on your organization's phone plan. On the right hand side of the screen you will also find a chat and a Q&A box. We encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat to your fellow colleagues. This is Melissa J is doing right now. There'll be two Q&A sessions throughout the webinar today. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat box and we'll be collecting them and we will be presenting them to our presenter when the time comes at the designated question and answer times. If you need any technical assistance or experiencing any difficulties, please contact my colleague Dylan Griffith, AMSA Settlement Events Coordinator at events at amsa.org or you can call him at 604-718-2783 and he will assist you um, and guide you through any te technical difficulties that you may encounter. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the AMSA website and we will send you a notification email once it's been uploaded. Also included in the email that you received from me yesterday was a handout and the PowerPoint slides and we encourage you to use those as self-reflection tools and to be able to continue the conversation of implementing social media um, with your colleagues following the webinar. My colleague um, Baharta Harry, AMSA Sectoral Commu Support Coordinator, is also live tweeting this event. So join the conversation online using the hashtag AMSA events um, and you can follow and ask questions via Twitter and just comment and engage with us. AMSA's Twitter handle is at AMSA BC and our presenter Jennifer can also be found on Twitter at um, and her handle is at Jennifer Baker CO. So before we get started, I just wanted to briefly outline um, that AMSA is a provincial association of organizations focused on immigrant settlement and integration, diversity and inclusion, and multicultural health. AMSA is contracted by Citizenship and Immigration Canada to support a broad range of immigrant service providers and stakeholders in BC. And AMSA, we would like to thank Citizenship and Immigration Canada um, for the support provided to BC's immigrant serving sector and we would gratefully acknowledge the, the financial support provided in delivering today's webinar. So we're going to engage in, in our first 
poll of, of today and see how that goes. So I'm going to be launching a poll. We'll be having a couple of those throughout, throughout the, hand, the webinar. So the first poll that I'm going to launch is, are you viewing this presentation alone or in a group? So I'm seeing the, the votes are coming in. So I'll just wait another couple seconds before we close that poll. It's being tallied up. OK. All right, so I'm going to close that poll now. And then we can share the results. So 73% are watching this webinar today on their own, and 27 are in a group. So oh, about three quarters. So welcome to everyone who's watching in a group, and welcome for everyone who's watching on your own. So thank you for, for testing that poll function. We'll be using that a couple more times throughout the webinar. And so um, we wanted to ask you before we before Jennifer introduces herself and we gets on and dives into this fascinating content, we wanted to ask you where are you where are you joining us from today? So we would like to encourage you to um, feel free to introduce yourself, your team if you're in a group, in the chat box and and tell us where you're joining us from so that we can all connect with each other as well. So today's presenter, Jennifer Baker, is the founder and director of Jennifer Baker Social Media Consulting. Jennifer goes beyond explaining the importance of social media and gives her clients the skills and confidence they need to attract and retain customers and clients. Through careful attention to each client's needs, time constraints, and skill levels, Jennifer trains individuals to make social media work for their business. Jennifer has completed a Bachelor of Education in Adult Education and a Bachelor of Arts in Business and Economics from Brock University. So I'm going to hand over the webinar now to Jennifer so that she can get us through the, the content section of today's webinar. Excellent. Thank you. So I just wanted to introduce myself and I'm going to be turning on my webcam for a moment. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer and as Sabrina said, I'm going to be presenting today on social media. So I first wanted to thank AMSA for the invitation to present and deliver this webinar to you. And I also wanted to thank, thank uh, Sabrina and Melissa for all of their work and assistance in the last uh, week or so. So without further ado, let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about maximizing your impact um, and building collaboration through the use of social media. And we have a lot of content to cover today. Um, the first thing that we're going to be talking about will be just a quick uh, disclaimer with respect to the content that we will be discussing today. Followed by that, we're going to be talking about the benefits of using social media for your organization. And then we're going to follow up with the idea of creating a social media plan for your organization. And within that plan, there's going to be a few different elements. So managing your social media, which is always a very big topic that I discuss with clients um, and people like yourselves. And then we're going to touch on communication best practices. And you're going to learn a lot of really juicy, helpful, informative tips in this section here. So keep your eyes open for that. And we're going to also finish off, we're going to touch on cultural and linguistics importance and uh, with respect to social media. And then we'll close off with some final thoughts. So first of all, um, this presentation that we've developed is certainly a broad guideline. Um, so it's not specific to any organization. So I'd like to say that organizations should ensure social media is in line with their existing communication or marketing strategy and that's going to be different for every organization because some of the people and organizations attending are large organizations and some of them you know there's only one or two people who are working there so it's going to be very different depending on where you're coming from and the organization that you work within 
And I always like to say it's really important to develop a social media policy. And these are more or less guidelines that help guide staff um, through the social media in day-to-day -day work, just to ensure that's consistent and um, for troubleshooting. So without further ado, let's get into it. So we've got another poll. So I hope you guys like doing polls because we've got a few of these coming up during the webinar. So I'd like to know what your organization is currently using for social media. So we have um, Facebook and Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. So I'll give you a moment or two to respond to this because I just like to get a feel for the, for the group and what you're using. And then Sabrina, once everything's tallied up, could you let people know what uh, what the popular platforms are. Sure, Jennifer. I'm just letting the poll go for another couple seconds and then I'm going to sure. close it. So it looks like we definitely have a front runner. I can, I can guess what that's going to be. <laughs> Facebook. No surprise followed by Twitter, followed by YouTube is third, and LinkedIn is fourth. Looks like Instagram is the lonely one. I think the only one person selected. It's, uh, it's kind of a, Instagram can be a bit scary for some organizations, but um, certainly today's presentation will focus on Facebook and Twitter. So for those of you who are already engaged on those platforms, you're in luck because that's what we're going to be talking about today. Sabrina? Yes, Jennifer? I can't see the, the slide presentation come up. You can't see it? No. All right. Um, it looks like we're right now on the slide, the benefits of social media. So do you want to talk us through and we'll try going through the, the slides? Okay. Sure. No problem. So the first thing I'd like to touch on is the benefits of social media. and this is what a lot of people are going to use as their basis points for starting a social media strategy, you know, asking those questions of why should my organization be on social media and you know, what's the point of being here. So in terms of global social media use, currently there's, there's 7 billion people in the world and of that there's 3 billion of them who are active internet users and of that around 2 billion people are active on social media. So to give you an idea, that's certainly a lot of people who are using social media and even their mobile devices to connect with social media um, accounts. And what they're doing on social media, like many of you who have Facebook and Twitter accounts personally, you're connecting with people abroad. You might be connecting with family members who don't live in town. You might be um, connecting with people from your past, so people you may have gone to school with or, you know, past neighbors and whatnot. So it's certainly a very social environment. Now digging down a little bit deeper are the statistics for Facebook. And currently, and this, this number is from earlier this year, but there's 1.39 billion monthly active users on Facebook. So these people have a Facebook account and they're active. So that means they're logging on, they're posting pictures, they're posting videos, they're chatting with their friends. Now, what's really interesting, and I liked, uh, I bolded this, this stat because it's really interesting to me, is that 23% of users are actually checking their account five times a day. So many of you who may have employees, you might be thinking, geez, you know, they're checking Facebook five times a day, what are they doing? And I attribute a lot of this statistic to younger individuals. So those individuals who are accessing Facebook on their mobile device. They, they open up their app on their, their phone, they scroll through to see what's going on, and they shut it down. And they'll do that several times a day, as opposed to somebody who may be in their 40s or 50s, who logs onto Facebook at the end of the day, with a um, sits down and looks at pictures. So, you know, they might be catching up with what their friends are doing, perhaps wedding photos. So, 
the young and the old do use Facebook very differently. The younger people are logging on several times a day for very short amounts of time. And people who are 40 plus, they log on typically once a day. They do all of their Facebook checking out and then they log off. But they are on for a lot longer. And then you can see the age breakdown as well. So there have been a lot of reports out currently that say, you know, young people aren't using Facebook. Um, you know, they're navigating or they're going to other platforms like Instagram, and they certainly are. However, I've also read reports about young people, so those 18 to 29, they have a Facebook account because they seem like the odd one out if they don't. And they get questioned by their peers if they don't have this Facebook account. So you can certainly see that you know 84% of those 18 to 29 year olds have a Facebook account, and you know around 50% of people who are above the age of 65 also have a Facebook account. Now, in terms of Twitter, there's around 500 million users of Twitter, and I've also read interesting art articles and information on Twitter, and it seems to be this this grouping of people who are 18 to 29. Um, and above 30 who are really using Twitter the most. And of that, there's around 280 million active users. And 400 million tweets are sent per day, which is absolutely astounding. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Twitter, um, it's a social media platform where you send short messages that are under 140 characters in length. So moving along, I get asked a lot with people, and it, certainly I work with um, small businesses, not-for-profit organizations, I get asked a lot, you know, isn't a website enough? They'll say to me, you know, I have a website, you know, it takes a lot of time, money, and energy to, to maintain our website, isn't a website enough? And certainly a website is only one piece to the puzzle. And as you can see, I've, I've highlighted that. You can see all the other different types of marketing that are available and certainly some things that aren't included on here as well. But what I find with a website, and it certainly has to do with how a website is designed, developed, and managed, but many times a website has limited reach. You know, unless they're actively seeking you and your website out, you know, it, it can't go much further. And many times it's very low engagement. You know, you present your material, you present your photos or videos or content, and me as a user, I can't interact with that at all. Now many websites are getting much better where they do include different elements for social sharing or they might have blogs where people can, can post, but a website is certainly own, only one piece of the puzzle. Now getting into, into the benefits, and many of you are probably looking at the picture saying, oh yes, I remember this from last year, but social media is about social sharing and you know, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge is a great example to, to think about. And I just wanted to touch on why this worked so well. And a lot of people I've started to see um, copycats, I guess, as you will, with respect to this fundraising campaign, but nothing really works as well as the original. And the reason why this worked so well, it was unique. Nobody had done anything like this before. It was fun. You know, what's a better thing to do in the middle of summer than dump a bucket of ice water on your head? It's easy for people to do. So I saw videos from everything from, you know, garbage boxes and blue bins and garden pails. You know, anything you can find around your house, dump some ice, dump some water, and you've, you've done the challenge. It was low cost, you know, for a lot of people to do. They didn't have to go out and purchase anything or do anything crazy. Um, and, you know, in that, the ALS uh, Association did get a lot of donations, which is great. And the one really big thing that caused this to go very viral was the tagging aspect to it. So if you're not familiar with tagging, there is reference to this definition on your handout, as well as some other words. But tagging very quickly allows social media users to tag their friends such that those friends will get notification of that tag. So it was all that using and leveraging networks. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I want you to think of, you know, what could you do um, or things that you could do within your organization that really leverages unique, fun, easy, low-cost activities. Now another thing that you can do and some of the benefits to social media is you're going to be meeting like-minded individuals. So you might find people who um, visit your Facebook page or tweet to you on Twitter, they're very like-minded. They might be um, 
partnering organizations, they might be past clients of yours, but they're going to be of that like-minded, um, like-mindedness. And they're going to start to engage with you, so that might involve sharing your posts or liking your content, because that content is relevant to their lives. And you might think about that in your own life and what you do on Facebook. You know, why do I want to share this content or why do I want to retweet this information? And we will certainly talk about increasing engagement a little bit more in the webinar, but social media is about being social, and social media is about engaging and interacting with your fans and followers. Um, there's many times where I see social media accounts acting like a fax machine. So you would just compose your message and you would fax it out to the world, um, whereas social media is not that. You know, it's about creating conversations and getting engaged with your community and interacting with those fans and followers. And just to expand on that idea a little bit further, um, social media is about increasing reach. So when users begin to engage with you, and many of you who currently use Facebook right now for their organization will notice this, but when users engage with you, and that involves if somebody likes a post, if they comment on a post, if they share your post, um, and on Twitter if they're retweeting you, the reach of that original post is going to increase. So you can see the little chart at the bottom. You know, If you've got an original post and you've got a client who likes it and then a client who shares it, now there's that additional reach. So those additional eyeballs who are going to see that post without even you doing anything or spending any dollars. So to further this a little bit more, just to get you thinking, and we will touch on this and we'll come back to this in a moment, but developing online relationships with those like-minded organizations to share content. And I see this um, a lot, and this is the part that's it's relatively easy to do, it's low cost, and it works very well. So again, the little chart that I've made below, if you have three partners, and these partners can be, um, can be many different things. It could just be a very satisfied client. It could be a chamber of commerce. It could be um, local government. It could be a local organization that supports you. So you might only have 300 likes. You might only have 100 likes on your Facebook page. But if you look at your partners, so partner A has 500 likes, partner B has 600, and partner C has 400 followers. You add those up in terms of where your message was shared, and that number grows quite a bit. So it goes up to 1,800, and you really haven't done anything. It's just you've developed those partnerships such that they will share your content for you. So I want you to start thinking about those types of partnerships that you could, you could develop. So I did want to touch on this very briefly um, within the presentation, but within Facebook, and this only happens on Facebook pages, but you can target key messages. So at the bottom of the screen, you will see a screen capture of a, of a Facebook post, and you'll see four little gray icons at the bottom, and one looks like a crosshair, and that's the fourth one in. That, if you've never clicked on that before, that allows you to target your messages. And you can target them by location, so it can be a province if that's the case, or it can be a city, um, or you can target by language, so the different languages that, you, um, that are spoken or people you service, or age and gender. So there's a few other ones that you can include in there. Um, and I only bring this up because sometimes people say to me, they say, well, you know, I'd like to speak to this group, but I don't want to inundate people with this information when it's not relevant. So they're just, I wanted to let you know that there is that option to target those types of key messages based on a few different descriptors. So something also that comes up, so as I get through the benefits, um, people start to ask me, they say, well, Jennifer, you know, what's the cost of this? And I put together this little chart just to give you an idea. And I understand a lot of you are going through on the CFP process. So just to give you an idea for budgeting. So a low cost. Um, and I see many organizations do this very well. So they utilize an existing employee and typically this employee has a communications marketing background, it might even be a customer service background. So they utilize that existing employee to work on and manage their social media. And within that, that existing employee um, does video if that's um, a chosen strategy. Um, they design all the graphics in-house, they do the own photography, 
the other thing is there's no paid advertising. So many of you might be familiar with paid advertising on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn currently. But if you don't have the, the budget for that, you know, you don't have to do any paid advertising if you don't want to. Now we also will touch on um, management programs a little bit later. They are defined in the handout. But you can utilize a free version of a social media management program. Many of them do have a it is limited, but it is free. So if budgets are tight, low cost is you can certainly get by that way. Now the mid to high cost, this is where you know all the bells and whistles, you can you can blow them and have a very large social media budget with this. So many people decide to have many people decide to hire outside companies, marketing agencies, web development companies to manage their accounts for them. So this person typically acts like a third-party consultant. In addition, this you know they can hire people to do beautiful graphics and expensive, long, informative videos, and they also may engage in paid ads on Facebook and Twitter as well. So you know, paid ads can be as little as twenty-five dollars a month, or it might be twenty-five hundred dollars a month. It really depends on your budget. And then within that, so touching on the management programs, you can have a paid management program as well. So many of them, you know, many start at $9 a month, but they go up depending on what, what you'd like with that program. So just to give you an idea of cost, um, because I do realize you are going through the, the CFP process at this point. So the next thing that we're going to discuss is developing a social media plan. And this is so important because many times I, I work with individuals and companies and they say, well, you know, we need to be on social media. And I say, well, what for? And they look at me and they say, well, everybody's doing it. That's why. And I, I, so I see that a lot of people are very excited about social media. They don't want to be left behind, but they're not quite sure why they want to be on social media. So we're going to discuss that. So the social media plan, I like to have my, my flow charts, as you can probably notice, but I like to start with goals. You know, what do you want to achieve from your social media? Then followed by that will be objectives, strategies, tactics, and evaluation. So we're going to discuss all of these levels in detail. So step one and two, what do you want to achieve through your social media? And when I was designing this seminar, the examples that came to mind for me were, you know, increasing an organization's exposure. So getting as many individuals and eyeballs exposed to what you and your organization does and the services that you provide. Um, the other thing, another example of a goal might be increasing traffic to your website. I, I work with a lot of organizations where they say, we just want to get our traffic, our web traffic up. Uh, another goal that I, I typically see is increasing partnerships. So those partnerships we talked about earlier, you know, if you're only working with maybe nobody or you might be working with two or three, thinking about leveraging those partnerships because that can be certainly low cost and um, very impactful for your social media. So I see that we have a, another poll coming up. And the poll is going, oh, there it is. So what are the social media goals for your organization? So if you've thought about this within your organization, um, or even right now, this might be the first time you've thought about it, but what would you, what would you want to do? What would you want to achieve from utilizing social media? Would it be increased exposure, create partnerships, increase traffic, get on social media? I see that a lot where people say, well, I need to be on social media, um, or it might, you're, you're not sure yet. So when you fill that out, I'll get Sabrina to read us the results. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. I'm just going to wait a couple more seconds. I can see all the answers are coming in, and it's being tallied. And so far, it looks like we have a front runner. Ooh. So I'll just wait another two, three, closing that poll now. So the front runner was 71% want to use social media to increase exposure, followed by increase their traffic to the website, followed by creating partnerships. And there is one, one or two who are not sure what their what their goal is or their goal is to get onto social media. Okay, that's great. Thank you, everybody, for responding.
All right, so now that many of you do have that idea that you want to increase exposure for your organization, we're going to dig a little bit deeper and talk about those objectives. So um, within an objective, and many people see this with respect to goal setting, the SMART goals, um, I like to call them SMART objectives, but when you're developing objectives, they need to be specific. You know, what are you really trying to achieve? They also need to be measurable. So typically that's found with a percentage or um, a number in mind that you want to achieve. And they also have to be attainable. You know, a lot of people, you know, I would love to get to a million followers on Twitter, but I don't think that's attainable. Um, and the same thing with realistic. So they, they touch on that. I would, you know, I would love to have that, but that's not going to happen, I think, overnight. And they also need to be timely. So when you're developing your objectives, you need to give an end point. So it might be the end of your quarter, or it might be a fiscal year end. So when you get to that point, you will know if you have achieved it or if you, or if you need to improve it for the next time. So dig, to, to dig a little bit deeper, the first one that we're going to be talking about is the exposure. So many of you are in luck, so the 70% of you who had stated that exposure is your main goal for social media. Um, the first thing to know is that exposure is measured by reach. Um, reach impressions and views. So those are statistics and information that you can find on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, they are readily available and we'll talk about them a little bit later in the webinar. So for an example, a goal might be to increase an organization's exposure. Very overarching, very broad, almost a little bit vague. But then we dig a little bit deeper to the objective and see how it gets very, very specific. So increase Facebook daily post reach to a thousand by August 31st, 2015. So you will know by September 1st if you achieve that objective or not. So you can, you can replace Facebook with uh, YouTube views or you could replace it with Twitter. And then you can, you know, you could have YouTube, for example, increase YouTube uh, views to a million by December 31st. So that could be another objective. So that's a very good template to, to begin with when you're starting to develop your objectives. Now the next one that we're going to be talking about is traffic. So many of you might be familiar with web traffic. So it is measured by page views, unique visitors, length of visits that they are on your website. So your overarching goal might be increased traffic to the website. You could even have specific pages if there are specific pages that you uh, want to increase the traffic for. So if it's a client service page um, or a contact us page because you know they're, they're going to be contacting you, it can, it can be a little bit more specific. Now the objective, increase website page views to 500 by December 31st, 2015. So again, by the end of the year, you'll understand and it will be very clear if you have, ach have achieved that objective and as a result that goal. And then the last objective slash goal that we're going to be talking about is the partnerships. So partnerships in this case is, is very simple. So it's measured by the number of active established partnerships that you have developed and are currently maintaining. Now, with respect to developing partnerships, we will touch on this again later in the webinar, but there is more information in the appendix of the handout with respect to partnerships. So your goal, again, very broad, increase partners. Now, your objective might be something like increasing partnerships to 15 by the end of the year, so by December 31st. Um, and that might be a lot smaller for some of you, so you might have a, a, an objective to increase partnerships to two. And some, some of you who do have a lot of resources, you might increase your partnerships to, you know, 100. That's being very ambitious, but um, increase it to 100 by the end of the year. So now we're going to dig a little bit deeper. And this, the next little part of the webinar is going to be talking about the strategies and tactics to achieve these goals and objectives. While it is great to have really big goals and really strong objectives, 
they're not going to do anything if you don't have strategies and tactics to back them up. So strategies will help to achieve your goals and objectives. So really the question that we're asking here is what are the steps that you need to complete to achieve the goal or the objective? And we're going to go through an example of this just to give you an idea of how this is developed. And it's probably a lot easier, um, easier than you think. It's just a matter of mapping everything out. So to go back to our first goal and objective, so increasing an organization's exposure. So for those of you, for those 70% of you who really wanted to increase your exposure, we've got it all mapped out for you. So increasing your organization's exposure, um, increasing that Facebook daily post reach to 1,000. So what are those steps that you need to do to increase a higher reach on your posts? And we're going to go through four different strategies. Now, for many of you, you might be thinking, well, there's more I want to do. So in the blue boxes under strategies, um, the ideas are in create engaging content, establish partnerships, integrate with your marketing, and do some Facebook advertising. Now, some of you who are listening to the webinar might think, well, I've got another really great idea. Can there be five strategies? Absolutely. Um, while other people might say, well, I could probably achieve this just doing two of the four. And Absolutely. So some of you might find that you need to do more, and some of you may find you can get away with less. So for the sake of this webinar, we're going to go through the four different strategies. So the first one about creating engaging content. This is a really big piece that I, I would love if all of you could think about, and it's about creating a content calendar. In the handout that you've been provided by Sabrina, there is an example of a content calendar as well as a link to a sample content calendar. Now there are many examples on, on the internet and on Google that you can use, and it's about finding one that works really well for you. And the whole purpose of the content calendar is to organize and plan your content. And it can be set up many different ways. So you can have all of the, you know, many different holidays listed. You can include information about e-newsletters when they're coming out. You can have information about when Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn posts are coming out. And it's laying it all out and mapping it all out so that everybody knows what's going on within your organization. So like I said, there's many different tools that you can use. Some people use, um, you know, very high-end content calendar creating tools, and other people just use Excel documents or uh, Google Docs if they're sharing it amongst people. So certainly mapping out the type of content that you want is important. It will keep you on track and keep everybody within your organization on track. Now we're coming back to the idea of partnerships. And I think establishing partnerships is going to give you a large impact uh, for your content's reach at a very low cost. You know, there certainly will be cost in terms of manpower to set up these types of partnerships and maintain these types of partnerships. But in terms of ongoing cost, there, there would be very little. So how do, I, how do I start with this? And reaching out to your partners via email or phone. And probably many of you speak to your partners, you know, a few times a week. So it's a matter of starting to get the wheels in motion for how this partnership will look. You know, is it is it going to be sharing every post that you create, or will it be sharing one post a week? Will it be tweeting all of your messages or just the messages about a specific topic? So it can it can look however you want and however is going to work best for you. Also in the handout is a guide um, that was developed for a business trying to develop these partnerships. So it goes through the how-to um, and provides a sample of what that partnership plan looks like. Integrating with traditional marketing is another really important strategy. And in my line of work, I always try and find really good examples of social media integration across um, different types of marketing, so traditional marketing, for example. So what I would like in my challenge to all of you is evaluate your existing collateral. 
So that could be anything from your business cards to banners to letterhead to PowerPoint presentations to you name it, um, anything that has your name and brand on it. And are you showcasing your social media? And certainly if you if you are tight on a budget, I tell people, well, you know, use up what use up your business cards and use up your letterhead and then on the next order, make sure that your social media is on there. Or if you're going to be going through a rebrand shortly, you know, get it all done now. But it's all about ensuring brand consistency such that people know how to find you on the internet. I was working on a project a little while ago and I had to look up social media accounts for a number of businesses and you'd be surprised at how many people don't list their social media on a, their website or it's only on their contact page or it's buried in the bottom left hand corner of their website. So think about that from a user perspective even on your website. You know where are our social media accounts listed? Do the links work? Because many times you just assume that they do so maybe after the webinar, check out your own website just to make sure all the links are working the way you think that they're working. The next little part that we're going to talk about is social media advertising. And I like to include this because it's a very valuable tool for spending your, your dollars. And it's very valuable because you have the ability, especially on Facebook, to target key demographic groups. So this can be age. So if you had an event geared at people who were between the ages of 30 and 40, you can send the Facebook ad just to those people. You can get even more specific. So it might be people who are aged between 30 and 40 who are female can get a little bit more specific. So people who are 30, 40 female and live in Edmonton and Calgary. Again, you can continue to get more and more specific based on their languages they speak, what they're interested in. And this information comes from individual Facebook users. So they have included this type of information on their profile. And as a result, an advertiser can use this information to target ads. So that's Facebook advertising. Twitter advertising works a little bit different. You still can um, target based on location and age, but the interests work a little bit different. It, it relates to what accounts they also follow. So you'll have to get, really get into the brain of your client to understand where, where they are spending their time. We will talk a little bit more about budget. It depends on what your budget is and how far um, the ads will go. But um, with the organizations that are not-for-profit that I've worked with, um, not-for-profits always get off a lot better than the for-profit businesses. So we will talk about that and I'll give you some examples of how much organizations need to spend to get in the game for social media advertising. Okay. So I think we are coming up to our first question and answer period. Yes, we are, Jennifer, and we already have a few questions here for you. The first is in regard to, um, to Facebook. You mentioned earlier that it's possible to target your message according to geographical location, language, or gender. Is there a cost associated with that? No, if you're referring to that slide I had up a little bit earlier when you are creating a post and we're going to be targeting, there is no cost to that. Okay, perfect. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, and while we're waiting for some other questions to come in, there's a bunch of questions. So please feel free to type your question to the into the question box and, and we'll make sure to to ask you. Another question that came up is when you're creating printed materials, what is the best way of, of showcasing your social media? Is it just displaying the logos or do you just display the link or what do you do? Oh, I love this question. So my favorite thing to do is actually to put the link. And the rationale behind that is you would never put on a business card, find us in the phone book. 
and you would never put on your business card, find us on the internet. So I'm not terribly sure how it became kind of common knowledge or the best practices to just say, find us on Facebook. And I always like to say it's not a treasure hunt to try and find you on Facebook, especially if your organization's name is a little bit different. So if you use an acronym or you add a location to your Facebook name, it might be a little bit more difficult to find you. So I always say include the link. Um, many of you might also see on printed material, you'll see the little Facebook logo, a slash, and then, you know, mine, for example, is Jennifer Baker Co. And it's the same across all platforms. So I have, typically on the bottom of all of my slides and presentations, I have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest slash Jennifer Baker Co. So if you are thinking about rebranding or if you'd like to clean things up a little bit in your organization, try and get the same handle across platforms. So Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, well, LinkedIn might be different. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And just following upon that question, um, Jennifer, individuals were asking, would you also recommend putting your social media links on your business card as well? And that, I've seen organizations do that really well, and some not so well. And I think it all has to do with your clientele, you know, if they are going to be using social media. But it also has to do with how much other content is on your social media, or sorry, is on your business card. So, you know, many organizations, they'll have their name, their title, a phone number, a cell phone number, a fax number, an address. And visually, it might be okay to get everything on there, but in a six six pitch font. It might be very difficult for some people to read, especially if it's a one-sided card. Um, that would certainly be a really good question for somebody or organizations doing your marketing collateral. You know, what is going to work best for me and trying to fit everything in. I would love if everyone would put their accounts on business cards, but sometimes it's just not viable based on um, graphics that you're currently using on your cards or how much other information is required. So I think we have time for one more question before we, we go continue with the, the presentation. And we do have a longer question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Okay. The question just came in terms of calculating the cost. You mentioned earlier that there's a cost, there's a low cost or there's a high mid to high cost for social media. Mm -hmm. when, when calculating and, and going through this, um, and as you did say correctly, organizations are currently going through their call for proposals. What little things do they need to be thinking about? Is it just the, the cost of the actual platforms? Um, and where can they find that information? Just, just go to those platforms? If you could maybe just ex highlight that a little bit more. Sure. So in terms of cost, um, again, it, really, it, it, it does depend. So if you are going to be um, engaged in social media, there is no cost to use Facebook. There is no cost to use um, Twitter. Instagram, Pinterest. There may be a cost with LinkedIn if you choose to use a premium account. I believe the last time I checked it was $50 a month. Um, but that's really it for headhunters and individuals in the HR industry. So if you're not of that type, you could definitely get away with a free account. Um, the other cost with social media, like I mentioned, would be um, advertising, if you choose to do advertising or not. Now, the, you know, for example, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, I'm not sure what they used, but the majority of their impact was cost-free. You know, it was you, people like you and I taking videos and sharing them. You know, they didn't have a cost to that. Um, the other cost would be if you choose to go external with your social media. So if you decide to either hire someone part-time or um, go to a third-party consultant for them to do your social media, there would certainly be a cost to that. Um, obviously, part-time will depend on, you know, how much you're willing to spend or what's in your budget, but consultants, they could range anywhere from, you know, I've seen as low as like $100 a month, and I've heard of people locally anyway spending as much as $3,000 a month for social media management. So, you know, if you are going and thinking in that route, I would certainly do some investigating within your community to see the different um, 
types of social media services and what you're going to get out of it and what the deliverables are going to be. And certainly negotiate, you know, if you don't want all the bells and whistles, maybe you can tailor it back a little bit to save a little bit on cost. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think we're just going to hold off on the rest of the questions till the end of the content, um, the end of the webinar, because I think you'll be covering some of these aspects throughout. Okay. So. Okay. So we'll get started again. So we're going to be digging a little bit deeper, and that's what tactics do. Um, they they start to fill out. Oops, they start to fill out what those strategies are and how we are going to achieve the strategies. So we're, we're continuing to build. And again, it's a, it's a flow chart. It's the easiest way to organize this information on developing your social media strategy. So the first one, engaging content. You know, what are we going to do? What, what does this engaging content look like? So it's creating good content. It's um, creating good messages. It's also scheduling and being consistent. Um, developing partnerships, uh, creating a list of those partners and strategies for sharing content. So let's just jump right into the content piece of things. And I do get this question a lot. Um, you know, in terms of best practices, how often do I need to be on Facebook? How often do I need to be tweeting? And I hope I didn't give any of the participants out there a, a heart attack, but if you are going to be on social media, you do need to be active. Now, Facebook, um, you'll see the little tilde, which means it might be give or take. So, um, you know, I do work locally with a gal, and we post once a, once a week, and that's her strategy, and it works well for her. There's other people I work with that they post seven or eight times a week. So it's really figuring out what's going to work well for you. So that same concept goes through for Twitter. So some people tweet, you know, every 20 minutes, which sounds crazy, but some people do that. And then some people tweet one or two times a day because Twitter is a lot more active. Um, it is a lot quicker than Facebook. LinkedIn, I've seen, so if you are posting from a LinkedIn company page or a LinkedIn professional profile, usually two or three times a week. Pinterest, um, you could be pinning stuff a couple times a week. Some people go through a binge and they'll pin 15 or 30 things in a day and then they won't be active for the rest of the week. And Instagram, for the, what, the one person out there who is using Instagram, trying to be active daily is, is, is recommended. Now, my, my warning with this is I find a lot of organizations get really stressed out when I put up this slide and they think we don't have content or I don't have anything important to say because it's scheduled for a later time. If you don't have anything important to say, don't say anything. Stay relevant to your audience. Um, don't go start posting cat videos because you know you're you haven't planned anything for today. Don't feel obligated to post um, and stay relevant to your audience. Now, for those of you who do, so those 70% of you who have a existing Facebook page, I want to bring your attention to the Facebook Insights. And these are available to anybody who has a Facebook page with over 30 likes. So these insights are a wealth of information. So first of all, they will tell you, so you can see the graph below, but they will tell you what days of the week your fans are logging on to Facebook. And this doesn't necessarily mean logging on to your page, but they're logging on to Facebook. So you can see from the graph that we've got, looks like Monday was the popular day. So 580 people versus Saturday where it was only 554. And I've heard a lot of people say, um, you know, Jennifer, like what's the big deal? It's only 30 people. But you know what, if two or three of those 30 people share your message within their friend group, it can certainly make a big difference. So when you are planning out those days to post on your content calendar, which we talked about, look at your insights. What days work best for you? And then down below that is my blue whale that I like to call him, and he shows you the best times to post. So Typically I see, and it's pretty standard, but it's around 9 o'clock in the morning and then 9 o'clock at night are the most popular times to post on Facebook. It might be a little bit different for your organization, so log in to your own insights and check it out. Um, 
but that's the best place to start. Now with respect to Twitter, for those of you who are engaged on Twitter, there is also analytics on Twitter. Um, I was working with an organization, uh, a previous client actually, and she said, what's the best program for Twitter analytics? And I said, well, you're in luck because Twitter opened up their analytics probably about a year ago now so that everybody can see how well their tweets are doing. So when you log into your analytics, you will see a 28-day rolling summary, but then you'll also see a summary for each month. So it's with respect to mentions, reach, um, followers, most popular tweets, top mention. So it gives you an idea of the type of content that's really working for your organization. So logging onto Twitter, taking note of those popular posts, and then trying to do more of the same in the future. So you can see my, my peonies are, are doing very well for June. So what I'd like to say is for those of you who do have an existing presence on Facebook and Twitter, check your stats. What content received the highest engagement? And then what are the characteristics that made that content popular? You know, you might have to sit down and really think like, what was it about this picture or what was it about this quote? Um, or this information that we shared that made it so powerful. And then what you can do is start to replicate that content. In my own business practice, I found that while I wrote blogs all the time and posted them to Facebook, that wasn't the content that got people excited and it wasn't the content that got them clicking and sharing. So I did more, I did less of that and I did more of something else. So you might have to think about that in your own organization as well. So now that I've, I've um, discussed a little bit about frequency um, and the type of content that works for um, Facebook and Twitter, you can use third-party software to organize and schedule content. So first of all, uh, just a little aside, within Facebook you can do scheduling. So if you're only using Facebook and that's your plan for kind of the long term, you can schedule posts from within Facebook meaning you can sit down on a Friday afternoon and schedule your post for the next three or four weeks. Now, if you are using more than just Facebook, so let's say you're using Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus, or um, LinkedIn company pages, you can schedule it using a third-party software. Um, and it certainly makes it easy, and you can see the little um, calendar at the bottom, makes it easier to see what content is coming out and when it's coming out. And it's very easy to move stuff around uh, if, if events have changed or if your strategy has changed a little bit. Now, this third-party software, like I said, there are free versions and there are also paid versions of this as well. So keeping in mind your budget. So in terms of cultural content, it's, it's really important to be mindful of, of culture and language when scheduling within your social media. And because we work in a multicultural, diverse environment, our social media posts can be accept, accessed and viewed by individuals from around the world at any time. So one example that I just want to touch on, you know, highlighting certain cultural holidays is an opportunity to share and celebrate the diversity within our community. However, this needs to be done with great care. Um, for example, if we choose to highlight Christmas or Hanukkah, but then we don't highlight something else like Ramadan, we indirectly are giving weight to one holiday and one culture over another. So it might not even be something that we intended to do, but it's happening. So we need to be very careful of that. So when you do schedule, so using um, the third-party management, you can use the AMSA multi-faith calendar because they do list um, all the different types of holidays on their calendar. And it's, it's really easy to do with third-party because you already know when the, when the dates are coming out. And when possible, when you are posting about the different holidays and events that are coming out, try to seek input from somebody from within that culture. Don't just rely on Google, because sometimes Google isn't always right. And something else to note as well, certain topics might be better to avoid addressing online 
as it may lead to misinterpretation and misunderstanding. So this kind of goes back to our disclaimer that we talked about at the beginning. Um, and it might be contingent on what that policy is and what that policy looks like for your organization. So I also, in terms of best practices and communication best practices, just, this is a tough one. Don't automate your social media. So there's many tools available um, within Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn that allow you to create a post on Facebook and then it will automatically tweet. It goes in the reverse such that you can have a Twitter tweet automatically create a Facebook post. But what happens here is messages get misinterpreted and messages get cut off. So we can see on the left hand side this little girl with her smile quote, that's the original Facebook post, but then it automatically pushed to Twitter and it kind of cut off a little bit. Now if you're using a computer and you clicked on that blue link that you see, it would open up Facebook pretty easily. Now where it runs into challenges is for anybody viewing that tweet on a mobile device because what, Twitter, what Facebook will try and do, it will try and open Facebook in a browser instead of the app. And then you have to log in and it's many, many steps as opposed to um, just one. So don't automate your social media. Another one that I see as well is the, the LinkedIn to Twitter option as well. And this one, my slide's coming, I think. So this one, the LinkedIn to Twitter, um, actually this individual is a really good friend of mine and he is a HR professional, you know, very, very professional, respected individual. And this tweet came up from him and you can all read it. And it totally took away from what he was actually trying to say you know, about hiring practices and personality tests. And, you know, it certainly wasn't intentional, but it happened. And there's many, many cases of this happening with automating your social media. So what I would like to say is a lot of, well, I guess the biggest challenge with automation is people say they don't have time or they don't know how to use Twitter. If that's the case, just focus on Facebook. Or if you don't want to use Facebook but really are focused on Twitter, then just use Twitter. Don't feel obligated to be stretched across so many platforms and start to use these cheats because you, your messages might get mixed and the wires might get crossed. So rather than stretching yourself thin, just choose Facebook or just choose Twitter. And then as you become more comfortable with the platforms, then take some training, learn a little bit more about the other platforms. So another thing that you can do as well um, with third-party applications is the search function. And this is a part of social media that gets lost in the shuffle a lot. Many people view social media as you know, a way to push out their information again. But a lot of people don't realize that you can actually stop and listen to what people are saying about you, your organization, an event that you've run. Um, maybe your website, a specific phrase that you use. So it's important to do a search. So you can use third party, you can search on Twitter or Facebook individually and see what people are saying about you. And that's called social listening. And it's just taking a moment to see what people are saying and responding to them and choosing to respond to them. probably one of my favorite things about social media actually. So another thing that you can do within your organization, and this is a really easy one to do, it's one of those super easy things that you can do when you can all do it starting today, tomorrow, but if you're on social media, start to humanize your, your accounts. And it could be as simple as taking pictures when you're out at staff functions or writing in first person. So I am doing this, or we are doing this, and taking a picture. And it's a really easy thing to do. And these type of posts typically get high engagement these, because people know you. Um, they want to relate to you. They understand you. Um, and it is first person. 
and they want to communicate with you, as opposed to um, very corporate speak. Something else that you can do as well, again, very simple to implement, is asking questions. So creating content that gets people excited. And it could be as simple as, my slide is a little bit lagging here. You know, how many languages can you speak? You know, a very simple thing that you can do. And I typically find that questions, if they're one word answers, again, get higher, higher engagement. Um, it also works well when you provide people with options. So it might be as simple as, do you speak one, two, three, four languages? You know, giving people those options and they don't even have to think. But questions are a really great way to start engaged with and get engaged with people. You can also do a little bit of research about what people are interested in or, um, you know, what holidays do they celebrate and little things like that. So Jennifer, yes. why don't we just put that into practice right now and ask sure. everyone a question and get them to write it into the, into the, their answer into the, the question or the chat box about maybe what is like their favorite question that they've seen or answered on social media. Oh, I like that. So I can see a bunch of answers are coming in. So let's see what, what people are saying. All right. Um, so people are saying these questions that are often personal, that are related to, to them, that they identify with. Um, something that is happening locally, uh, an event, mm -hmm. something where there's a clear call to action. Okay. Very good. And those first two things that were mentioned, they're, they draw on that personal side, you know, that humanizing aspect. Okay. Is there any other responses or shall we continue? Um, I think we can con continue, but um, feel free to, to write your, continue putting your, your answers in that question box and we'll just keep on going. Okay, great. Okay, another thing that you can do as well is using visuals. And um, I've worked with a lot of organizations where they think they have to have, um, you know, hire an expensive photographer to, to take photos, when in fact, you know, pictures, you know, using your, your cell phone or iPhone um, work really well. And it just, again, it shows that human side to it. Um, that the photos aren't doctored or photoshopped, as many people call them, and it's just that really human side to your organization. Now, certainly they should still be professional, um, but in this case, you can see that it's you know this photo up here is, is casual, just showing what's going on, going on at the organization. And you will find across Facebook and Twitter that tweets and posts that include photos do have um, high amounts of engagement. They get the most clicks, they get the most likes, comments, shares. Now, if you are interested in some tools, um, they are in your handout, but one, two that I use is pickmonkey.com and Canva. So those are included in your handout, so you can refer back to them. They're really, um, they're free programs that you can use and they're really simple to use. Now, the next thing I wanted to touch on was, is the idea of hashtags. And hashtags um, are used on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So hashtags will increase the reach of your post and your tweet. You can also jump in on trending conversations. So if you've ever heard of some, um, you know, a, a news event that's trending, that means a high volume of people are using that specific hashtag. So there is more information in your handout, but very quickly, there's three types of hashtags that many of you will see. So there's a content-based hashtag, so C-D-N-I-M-M, -M, so Canadian Immigration. There's location-based hashtags, 
So this might be a short form of your city or town. It might be an airport code, or it might be the full name of your city or town. And then another type is an event-based. So hashtag AMSA events, or things like an NBA finals would be an example of an event-based hashtag. So more information is certainly in your handout. I would recommend giving that a view. Now, one that happened close to home, about two years ago, um, our area had a small ice storm and the individual skating on our road out front of our house is actually my husband. And what we had done, we took a short video, we used the hashtag, and then it got picked up by CBC Weather Network, Canadian Press. And it was a very bizarre um, how it all rolled out because we didn't have any power, yet we were talking to the Canadian Press about you know, my husband skating on the road and outside our house. So the power of a hashtag, um, I certainly encourage people to use hashtags in their um, posts and don't use more than three, otherwise you begin to look a little bit like spam. So use three really good ones. But before you decide to use a hashtag, I would recommend everybody doing some research on the hashtag before you do that, just to make sure you're in line with other people um, who are using that hashtag. So an example of a poor use of this is, um, it happened a few years ago now, and it was at in Aurora, Colorado. There was a, a shooting uh, at the movie premiere of The Dark Knight Rises. So a number of people were killed, a number of people were injured, a very tragic event. And the next day, this boutique out of, I believe they're in New York, they had sent a tweet out saying, Aurora is trending, obviously for this tragedy. But they thought clearly about our new dress that was coming in. So they also included the shop so people could buy online. Very distasteful. They didn't do their research. Um, some people say maybe it was clever marketing because now you know they were picked up by the news and people like me are talking about them. But I don't think I'd want my organization to be known for something like this. So just an idea like when you are choosing to use a hashtag, make sure just to ch click through and see what it what the conversation is actually about before you start to include your organization on that hashtag. Something else to consider as well, so we have talked about scheduling posts on social media and a lot of people think, great, I can schedule all of my posts for the month and then be done with it. And social media is certainly not a set and forget platform. So again, uh, an example of something close to home is the, the, the shooting at Parliament Hill last year. And, you know, me as an individual, I manage a, a few accounts, and as I was listening to the CBC, I said, I can't have any of my accounts tweet. So my personally, as well as my clients. So I moved all of my um, pre-scheduled tweets and posts and LinkedIn and whatnot. I just moved them. I paused them all, and then I let all of my clients know that they're nothing was going out because it's not the right time. So you also need to be aware of what's going on in the world because you don't want to be that organization tweeting or posting about something when maybe there's something on the other side of the world that's going on that you should know about and that you should be respectful of. So just have that as, as an aside, but make sure it's not a set and forget. You need to be aware of what's going on. Now getting back to a little bit of a, a lighter topic, being social and being real. This is certainly, you know, leading back to that humanizing your social media. But if you want a good example of, of social media and how to do it really well, David's Tea, their, their tea shop started out in Montreal. They're very real. They're very human on their social media and they do an excellent job. And this, this example that I found a little while ago was just so cute. And, you know, you can see just by their response to this gal that, you know, they love what they do and they're very happy and bubbly and it comes through on all of their social media. So I did want to talk a little bit about the types of feedback that you're likely going to, to receive on social media. So it can be one of two things. So it can be the positive feedback. So you might get a post to your Facebook page, somebody might comment on a post, somebody might write a review about your um, organization, or somebody on Twitter might mention or reply. So depending on what type of response um, you get, there's a different type of auction that you can take. Now I do want to spend a little bit more time on negative feedback because this is this can be a tough point for a lot of organizations where they do get nervous about getting on social media because there is that opportunity for negative feedback and people to 
um, talk negatively about your organization. So there's a few different types of negative feedback that um, you may receive as an organization. So the first is um, a client who is just unhappy with how their service was. So it might be for a myriad of region, reasons. But certainly respond to them, apologize, and offer a solution. So just as if this person was standing in your office um, or talking to you on the phone, you know, that should follow through on your social media as well. You wouldn't ignore them. You would respond, you would apologize, and offer a solution. Now, there's also another type. There's that constructive criticism where um, this I seem to notice gets people really fired up when they say, um, you know, I really liked your service. It would be better if dot, dot, dot. So um, with that, respond, thank them for their suggestion. And then the other two, um, rants and trolls. The rants, I would certainly respond to it and then correct the issue, remain positive. And the other last one is a troll or a spam. So typically I, I say you can delete these types of people because it totally ha has nothing to do with you or your organization. And with respect to dealing with negative comments, don't ignore them. Um, try to respond to them as quickly as you can. You know, certainly you don't want to leave them for many days. Um, Communicate with them as they communicate with you. So if they did write a post on Facebook, respond to them on Facebook. And then certainly take steps to resolve the situation. So the next little part we're going to talk about is developing those types of partnerships. So one thing I'd like to always say, it's not all about you. Sometimes it's all about you, but most of the time it's not always about you. So posting content that um, you know, is about your partners and what your partners are up to. They're going to love that and they will begin to share your content. Um, you know, I, I frequently do that. I tell clients to do the same thing as well. You know, people like yourselves on this webinar, it's important to um, be aware that it's not always about you. So when you go about to create these online partnerships, you know, setting a meeting or call to um, address your ideas for a partnership, Reach out and like their Facebook page. You know, you can like their Facebook page as your organization and not necessarily from your personal account. You can also follow them on Twitter, or if they have a LinkedIn account, you can follow them there. And then decide what type of content you want to share and how often. Because while you might be partners, um, not every type of content, you want to share everything. So be very clear about how much you're going to share and what type of content you're going to share. So when you're starting to think of those types of partners, um, are, you know, they could be something like a municipal government, they could be your chamber of commerce, perhaps local employment agencies, or key industry partners. So if you'd like, um, type in the chat box the type of partners that you currently work with or ideas that you have for partnership. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And I see we're, we've got about Perfect 10 minutes. Jennifer, why don't we continue? Yeah, we have about 10 minutes left. And then if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll read out some of those partner suggestions that people have been typing in. Perfect. Okay, great. So just to wrap everything up, this is typically how your strategy is going to look. So you'll start with your goal, objective, strategies, and tactics. And you can see how we kind of wove the different aspects into the different tactics. So something that I wanted to touch on, and this seems to be a big topic that I, I see a lot when I do presentations, is the idea for people to like our page. And it almost seems desperate sometimes when, um, you know, people say, like our page, like us on Facebook, like us on, you know, follow us on Twitter. And it sometimes can be very exhausting. Um, on average, people like 70 pages. And on average, these people have 338 friends. So if you were to think that if those people posted at least once a day, you're looking at 400 posts minimum. So why should someone like your page? You know, make a jot down a little note um, as you're going through the webinar. You know, what's in it for them? You know, what are they going to get out of it? Will it be com community information, events, news? But let them know and tell them why they should like you. So the last little thing that we're going to touch on is cross-promotion tips. So like I was saying, and this was a question that we had at the Q&A time, but um, that's the example that I was telling you about. So 
Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, slash Ontario Parks. So don't necessarily just say find us on Facebook, um, but certainly include your address. And also use accurate logos. Very important. So the last little part is the advertising. So I had mentioned that we'd be coming back to social media advertising. And I just wanted to touch on targeted Facebook advertising. So we're not going to talk about Twitter, but we will talk about targeted Facebook ads. And you can target these ads based on age, gender, location, language, um, places that they work, um, different interests that they have, and keywords even. So it's very, very powerful. So for example, I, I did a quick example for people who lived in Vancouver plus 10 miles who were any age, really, um, who spoke Italian, Portuguese, and French. And there was 42,000 people who came up in that search result. So now I'm only going to be spending marketing dollars on those 42,000 people and not the, the, mass, the masses. So if you're thinking, okay, how much does this cost? Here's an idea of how much all of this costs. So these were some um, Facebook ads that I did with my clients, and the ones in red were actually not profits, to give you a better idea of um, the organization. So you can see for um, the fourth one from the bottom, $175 spent got them about 850 clicks to their website, and their reach was 21,000 people. So again, thinking about your CFPs, this is, this is a good idea of how much you're spending on Facebook ads. So if you're thinking about how much you're spending on traditional print media, you know, maybe this might be something to add to your budget. So that wraps up tactics. And the last little piece is evaluation. So while it's great to do goals, objectives, strategies, tactics, how well are we achieving all of these goals? So it's really important to review all of your statistics at the end of the year or the end of the quarter um, to determine whether or not you achieved your goals and objectives. So did you achieve them? Did you not? Why did they work? Um, and why didn't they work? Okay. And the final thought that I wanted to leave you with was why did you sign up for Facebook? Why did you sign up for Twitter? What makes you click share? Um, and that's a really powerful thing that I want everybody to think about because you need to start making content that you're interested in. So I understand that organizations and um, you know do have communication goals and marketing goals, but we also have to think about what's going to work. Um, so think and reflect upon why you signed up for Facebook and what type of content you like and what type of content you enjoy. And what makes you click share? What makes you click like? Okay, so we are wrapped up. Um, so we did cover a lot today. We talked about the benefits. We talked about creating your social media plan, um, best practices, and then getting you to think about why you, as a person, signed up for social media and what is important to you um, in the world of social media. So Sabrina, I can hand it back over to you. Sure, and while people have the opportunity to, to write and type some of their questions in the question box, I just wanted to read out a couple of suggestions that um, individuals wrote for partnerships. So some of them were um, partnering with like local, um, local employment agencies or other social service providers, funders, unions, school districts, the credit union, the local library, municipal governments, your chamber of commerce, and also local cultural groups. So that was a good um, a good variety. Oh, and somebody also just wrote with, with, with bloggers who are also known within a certain area or certain demographic. So that was great some idea. great partnership ideas, but we do have some questions for you. Sure. All right. So. If you could, um, what is the best tool um, for efficiently using, um, in, sorry, so it was, I'm just trying to read this here and scroll it. Um, how do you access the Twitter stats? You mentioned oh. earlier that there was possibility to access those Twitter analytics. Could you say how you actually get to those? Sure. Um, so on Twitter, 
Um, you do technically have to sign up for advertising, so if you can either access it um, from the navigation bar in the top right hand corner, it will be your profile picture, so it's either your face or your, your organization's logo. And then in that drop down menu, there will be Twitter ads. Um, and if it's not there, it's going to be on the, the right hand side. But under the Twitter ads, it'll ask you to sign up for an advertising account. Um, you don't have to put in your credit card, you don't actually have to do ads. And then once you sign up for that account, it basically turns on your analytics and you can view it. Okay, and another question. Um, how do you recommend that an organization chooses which social media platform to actually be on and to use? Okay, that's a really good question. And I did touch a little bit on about who is using what platform. And that an organization should use the platform that their clients are going to use. So Facebook tends to be the one that everybody graduates. Um, uh, gravitates towards and it's because most people are using it and it spans uh, age and gender and um, all sorts of demographics. Now when you get into the more um, like Twitter for example it does gear under 45. So if your client base is under 45 and younger then Twitter might be a great opportunity for you however if you're servicing people who are 45 plus it may not be a great venue. Now Instagram is typically under 30 years of age. So again, if you're servicing a younger client base, you might want to be on Instagram. Um, but if you're servicing an older um, target audience, over 30, then Instagram is probably not the best place for you. Pinterest, uh, that one is more or less defined by gender. So um, female, certainly any, I've seen stats anywhere from 75% to 90% of the users are female on Pinterest. Um, Age, usually under 40 is typically what I see. And then, um, I think I've covered all of them, yeah. So it's not about being on all of them, it's about being on the one that is right for you. So it might be one, or it might be two or three platforms. But it all depends on who your clients are. All right, and Jennifer, um, another question that came in is, what tool do you use to measure goals? Do you just use those um, analytical tools that you offered from, like that Facebook or Twitter has, or do you recommend a third-party tool like Hootsuite? Um, I typically just use um, Facebook and Twitter. Um, professionally, I use Hootsuite as well, but you know, I get the same analytics from Facebook as I would from Hootsuite, so I just go right to the source for me and my clients. Okay. Another question is, how do you come up with a hashtag for an event? Like, how do you decide what to use? That's a really good question. Um, has to be unique. It has to be short. Um, and it also has to be something that people aren't already using. So you've probably noticed if you're if you've watched TV in the last little while um, that companies and brands are asking people to join the conversation and use a hashtag as opposed to follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook. So when you're coming up with this hashtag, it has to be easy, it has to be short, it has to be memorable. And um, I've seen hashtags that are quite long, so over you know a dozen characters. And when you get into that, people start to spell it wrong. So then you start to lose them. So keep it short, um, concise, and memorable. So what do you suggest for a newbie, um, somebody who's new to social media who wants to learn about where can they find information about the trends or newest apps or platforms for advertising? For advertising specifically or just in general for social media? I think in general for social media. Okay. Um, a couple of the sources that I use, um, one that I've been reading for almost 10 years now is uh, socialmediaexaminer.com. Um, really good information, very simple. Um, typically, they have videos and um, podcasts, um, infographics. They're very good. Um, another source is Social Media Today. It's a um, user-generated content, so people like myself write in um, with updates on what's going on in the world of social media. But those are two really good sources for news and information. Um, you can also subscribe on Facebook to their newsroom updates. So when they have product updates, you would be the first to get that. And then the same thing for Twitter as well. Follow the main Twitter account um, because they're typically sending out information about 
um, product updates or things that are in the works. So at least you have a heads up with respect to what's coming down the pipeline. The questions are just flying in here, so I'll just go for another <laughs> one, and then we. Sure. I do notice that it is 11:30, and I, I do want to honor everyone's time, but at the same time honor all the questions that are coming in. So I'll maybe ask this one question. We will. Um, I'll close the the webinar officially. Just close the ending, and also just tell a little bit about a quick AMSA resource that we've just launched that will hopefully help all organizations in, with their CFPs, and then we can do one or two more questions. And if, if you need to leave and are scheduled for another meeting at 11.30, um, we understand if you need to leave. So a question that came up is, if I don't know a certain social media platform, but my target audience is using it heavily, how can I learn or where can I learn it? From my experience and my background, the best way to learn how to use something is to, to use it. So while I wouldn't recommend setting up an account under your organization's name and, and starting to muddle through it, set it up under a, I don't want to call it a fake account, but a pseudonym. And, you know, for example, if it's Instagram, you know, set it up as a pseudonym and, and hang out and click everything and see what other people are doing and, and check out accounts that are making waves and the ones that have the highest amounts of followers and just see what they're doing. So, um, you know, I'm very much a preacher of learn by doing and because social media moves a lot quicker than formal education, um, it can be difficult to find training opportunities on, um, you know, different topics. So my first recommendation would be to signing up um, and just clicking and don't be afraid of making mistakes but certainly do it under an unofficial company name. And then once you figure it out, you can set up your official accounts. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So I just wanted to cl close, um, but we're still going to come back to a couple more questions since there are still so many. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for presenting and, and giving us all this valuable information, getting us to think about our social media and, and how we use social media. Um, but also, I just wanted to, to let everyone know, since we are all in the process of writing those CFPs for Citizenship and Immigration Canada, that AMSA has created a dedicated online special resource page with links to various resources that we may think that we think may help you in putting those proposals together. And so that resource can be accessed at um, www.amsa.org slash CFP resources. And so there's a list of like demographic information, research reports, and a whole bunch of other information. So I hope you do check that out and that it is useful for you in writing that CFP. So I just wanted to, before we get back to all the questions, also just again acknowledge that funding for this event was provided by Citizenship and Immigration Canada. And I'd like to thank the AMSA team for all their work that they put into this event to make it happen. Thank you so much. And my colleague will be sending out an evaluation link shortly after this webinar. And also the link to that specialized resource page will be in that email. And we, we would really appreciate it if you could fill out that evaluation form. Your feedback is really important to us and for us and, and helping us to improve future events, but also in guiding the topics that you want to see um, for your future webinars. So thank you so much. And I will give, go back to the questions since there are so many. Um, so maybe two, three more questions, and then we will be ending this webinar today. Sure. So Jennifer, is there a difference between youth and adults in terms of targeting marketing um, when using Facebook or Twitter? Um, I would say yes, and the reason is youth. So, and when I say youth, I I would consider that under thirty. Um, they're very savvy. They know when they're being marketed to, and you have to be very careful about the messaging that you provide to them and the messaging that you do that is tailored at them because they, they see through marketing very, very quickly as opposed to people who are 30 plus who may not necessarily see the marketing side um, to that Facebook post or the, to that Twitter tweet. Um, so you may find that you're doing two different messages for the same topic because it's two different audiences, so the under 30s and the over 30s.
Okay, perfect. So I have one final question. In in different countries, um, there are different social media platforms um, that are used or different applications or different ethnic communities use different social media platforms. If, if I if an organization would like to target individuals from that particular population group, um, should they learn and get on that tool? Um, what would you recommend? I think that's a great idea. And it's all about being where your clients are. And if they're using a platform that's only known in you know, India, then you need to be there as well. And it would just be like, you know, if you're trying to target somebody in let's say Mexico, but you know nothing about the country and you've never gone there and you don't do any advertising there, how are they ever going to find out about you? So if you find, and it might be your, your clients telling you this, like, hey, there's this great social media platform, but it's only really for our country and only really people from our country are using it, you know, probably would be a really great idea to investigate it and perhaps create an account for there as well. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, again, Jennifer, for, for presenting all this really valuable, juicy information. So I'd also like to thank everyone who's joined us today. It's been, it's been dynamic. There's been a lot of um, questions and there's been a lot of engagement. And I'd just like to let you know and remind you that this webinar was being recorded and we will make it available um, to you on the AMSA website. So please watch out for your Settlement Net Weekly um, alerts to, to for more information when this webinar will be posted online. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Bye-bye.